Hi everyone, my name is Jason Klein. I'm the director of P20 Initiatives at Northern Illinois University, and we're back with another episode of Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads. If you haven't caught our episodes, they're all available on our blog. That uh, address will be at the end of this video, and they're all on our YouTube channel. So today we're real excited to bring you uh, another career pathway, this in the human and public services pathway. We've got an attorney with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to Arthur to let him introduce himself. Arthur, tell us about yourself. Um, my name is Arthur Mingo. I graduate from Southern Illinois University School of Law. Uh, I graduated in the year 2014. I passed the bar uh, in November of 2014. The bar is a three month period after uh, graduation. Um, and I live uh, in Calumet City, uh, which is a south suburb of Chicago, um, and I work as a lawyer. So tell us about what there's all kinds of different lawyers and some of the students watching this may may not even know that they may think all lawyers do everything from go to trial in big corporate cases to help people buy a home or write a last will and testament. Tell us about the kind of law you practice and maybe a little bit about uh, how different lawyers focus on different things. Okay, no problem. Um, the, the best way to think about what a lawyer does is to think about doctors. And I think a lot of people understand that not all doctors do all things. Um, if you've watched ER or Grey's Anatomy, you know there are certain doctors that do certain things, they do that one thing very well. Um, and then there are other doctors, like your general practitioner, the doctor you may go to for your yearly checkup, who do a little bit of everything. They're not experts in one field, but they're more of a jack of trades of everything. And that's how lawyers operate. So um, I myself am a, a small jack of trades. I have a preference for contract, um, and that is either A, uh, I will write the contract between my client and another client. Uh, we're trying to buy something or someone's trying to buy something from us or it will be contract disputes. Um, so a contract I, I have written or that was written by a, a, a previous party and there's a dispute. Um, the easiest way to think of a contract dispute is, hey, you were supposed to sell me uh, blue widgets and I opened up the box, the box inside, those are green widgets. And then you might say, well, for us that is considered blue. My client may say, no, for us that's considered green and we will deal with that issue. Um, I, trend, I tend not to take my cases to, to trial um, just because I'm very much an economic uh, forward looking lawyer. Some lawyers like to take their cases to trial and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, those are litigators and I believe there's a place to litigate, but at the same time you have to ask yourself how much money are you willing to spend to prove that you're right. Um, mm -hmm. So I do those. Um, I sort of run my own firm. I'm Put my put my foot out there, so I'm taking a little bit of all cases, and that's the reason why I said that contract work is really what I like to do. But I'm a small jack of all trades, so I've done cases in court, including um, domestic issues, you know, uh, uh, child payments, uh, last will and testaments, um, and other uh, some small criminal cases. When you're when you hang your own shingle or you start your own, your own law firm. You have to take what business you can just to keep everything moving forward. And then once you have enough customer base, you can start to say, hey, you know what? Myself, my firm, we're really going to focus on one area. And you slowly start to narrow in um, going from more of a general practice lawyer or doctor to more focused, specialized uh, practitioner. Cool. So let's let's try and come back to that whole idea of starting your own law firm in a minute. But first, let's go back a little bit earlier in your life and talk about your pathway through school. Um, so so you, you went to high school, you had to go to college to get a four year degree and a bachelor's degree, and then you go to law school from there. Can you just walk students through what that's like? Because I'm I'm not sure everybody knows about exactly what that process looks like to be an attorney. And then let's finish up by talking about that last hurdle, which is passing the bar. Sure, not a not problem. Um, 49 out of the 50 states require you to have a bachelor's degree in order to, um, I'm sorry, all states require you to have a bachelor's degree to go to law school. Uh, I got my bachelor's from the University of Illinois Springfield uh, in Springfield, Illinois. Um, with uh, my uh, bachelor's was in political science and I love political science so much being in Springfield, Illinois. And for those of you all who may not know, Springfield is our state capital. And our state capital is a very active state capital. 
Um, some state capitals are very sleepy. People come in, they do their job, and they leave. Whereas Springfield is the exact opposite. People are are there day in, day out, year in, year out, regardless if the General Assembly, which is our legislature, is present or not. And so there's a lot of political activity that happens in Springfield year uh, year round. Because of that, I decided to stay at uh, UIS and get my master's. Um, and so that is the more non-traditional aspect of mm-hmm. my educational career, because a lot of people will go to high school, go to, go to undergrad, and then go to law school. So let's let's step back a little bit and just talk more about, about your day-to-day job here. Um, thinking about the fact that a lot of the people who watch this might be middle school or high school students, could be some undergrads, uh, students in community colleges or four-year universities who are kind of exploring what they might want to do. What, what does a typical day or week look like just in general in a nutshell? Well, uh, a week is a, a better snapshot uh, mm-hmm. for the day. So a typical week, um, so I work two jobs. I do private I do private business. And so for my private business, it is first and foremost, if you decide to become a lawyer, I cannot emphasize enough the one skill that every lawyer needs to have, the ability to return phone calls. It may seem like a really weird thing, um, but here in Illinois, we have an, or- an organization called the ARDC. And the ARDC is where people go to complain to the state of Illinois about their lawyer. My lawyer screwed me over. My lawyer did this. My lawyer did that. And the number one complaint people have is my lawyer never called me back. Um, And so you want to make sure that you return phone calls. I'm not saying you have to return that call the next day, but generally speaking, try to keep your client up to date. So that's one of the main things that I do. I try to make a having an open line to my clients. I have a separate phone just for my clients. Um, I carry with me, I don't want to say all the time, but the majority of the time. So if you call me, I'll, I'll answer or I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. Um, the next is legal research. Um, very, very rarely will a fact pattern, let me, let, me, let me say that not so lawyerly, very rarely will the same thing happen twice. There will be things like it, but there won't be the exact same thing. And so I spent a lot of my time looking at place, places where the court has said, you know, we have these circumstances have happened and we make this decision, but we've had some slightly different circumstances over here happen and we make this decision. And I try to see, okay, my client's in the middle. So when we, if we have to go to trial, which outcome is going to happen? Because this one is really good for my client, but this one is really bad for my client. Uh-huh. And so I have to make that that that, ju- that that argument in my head of is our fact pattern a little bit more like this is are the widgets that I talked about earlier are they really blue or are they really green um, so that's part of it um, the other thing is taking um, questions from people who want who want to hire me listening to what they have to talk about for is happening in their particular fact pattern. Um, I have a um, um, client, he wants to hire me on. He he, he and his wife got divorced. He moved to Texas. His wife stayed here um, with their child. And he feels like he's not having enough communication with his child. So it's interesting because he's thinking about moving back here which would be great for me because I can work with my client one on one, but also I'm having to look at well, what are the responsibilities that she has to her husband mm-hmm. or to her ex-husband, and what was their actual agreement? So it's doing research, going to the court, pulling up documents because sometimes a client may come in and may not know exactly what they need to bring with them, mm-hmm. and so you you end up giving your clients homework and like, hey, I need you to bring me these things so I can work for you. The other thing that I do, and I'll be really quickly because I see what time it is, I'll be real quick, is um, I do what's known as stock review. And so um, if you ever see like huge class action cases, those cases have lots of lots of documents from either side. Mm -hmm. So if Acme Inc. was being sued by the federal government for selling rockets that don't get Wile E. Coyote where they're supposed to go, um, uh, Acme Inc. is going to, there's a process called discovery where Acme Inc. has to hand over things. Well, before they hand over things, they want to make sure that anything that they can keep to themselves, they do that. And it's my job to go through all their paperwork to go, okay, the government gets this, 
this is our rocket design. The government, they should have that. But these are comments about that, that Acme Inc. had with its lawyers. I'm going to put that to the side. Acme Inc. is going to hold on to that. And so I do both of those things at the same time. Mm-hmm. Cool. So what would you say is the most exciting part of your job? Um, the most exciting part of my job has to be when you know you're right. Um, <laughs> there is the, very rarely in the law field do you get to go, guys, I'm right. I looked at everything. B- believe me, I got it. I got the, I got the magic case. You know, this is this is a case from the state of Illinois, so it, it's it's our court. It's from our circuit. It's from our division, and it's from the judge that we're going in front of it. Very rarely, a lot of times you get to go in and go say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm like 85% confident. But when you have that 100% confidence, that is right there. And the only way you get that is through research, mm-hmm. is, is looking and looking. Um, being a lawyer is more like being a librarian than it is like being a TV show. Um, and being able to tell your client, you're going to be okay. Um, whether it be a contract dispute or be a, a family issue, people come to you because they're scared and they're nervous and they don't know what to do. And typically speaking, the most you can tell a client is, we're going to do our best. Uh-huh. But saying that doesn't always make people feel comfortable. Uh-huh. It's a lot, it doesn't happen often, but it's a lot more comforting to a client when I can tell that client, not only am I going to do my best, but you're going to win. And I've only been able to say that twice in five years, twice, because it doesn't happen that often. But when it does happen, it's great because you can see the burden being lifted off your client and them relaxing and enjoying whatever it is that brought them to you. So you talked a few minutes ago about how important it is to return phone calls and you just made the great comment of being a lawyer in the real world is more like being a librarian than what you see on TV. And uh, so what would you say are the skills that are most important for an attorney to have to be successful in their work? Okay. Um, Truth be told, being argumentative uh, or being someone who likes to be in arguments is not going to be the best skill you need to be a lawyer. It's just not. Um, and I, I am going to answer your question, but I'm going to make one quick aside and I'll jump mm-hmm. right to it. Um, law school is not designed to teach you the law. People think that law school, you're going to go in there and you're going to learn the Constitution, you're going to learn Buckley v. Vallejo, you're going to learn Dred Scott, and you are going to learn about these famous cases. But that's not what law school is there. Law school is there to teach you how to think like a lawyer. Um, one of the most famous examples that I can think of of getting people to learn to think like a lawyer is if I were to ask you, um, here's a trick you can play to your friends. Ask a friend, do you know what time it is? And it's something that I do with my clients. And if I ask you, do you know what time it is? Most people will say it's 311. And that's when I get to be the, the smart aleck lawyer and say, I did not ask you what time it is. I asked you, do you know what time it is? Mm-hmm. Do you know what time it is? Is a yes or no question. And then people go, see, that's why I don't like lawyers. They want to play these words. <laughs> and but being a lawyer is all about word games. So is there a skill that you can bring with you that helps you to be a lawyer, to, to be a lawyer to the best of your ability? Uh, when it comes to the thinking like a lawyer, not so much. But when it comes to putting your thoughts down on paper, yes, you need to understand the English language. Um, there are, for, for public record, lawyers who have written briefs and motions that make no sense. Um, mm-hmm. They're just very, very poorly written. Um, you need to know how to write. I'm not saying that you need to be the next great American wit. I'm not saying that you need to, that you need to be able to write for comic book movies or you need to write for Martin Scorsese. But I am saying you need to be able to put a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb together in a way where your judge doesn't have to read it five times. Because if they have to read what you're saying multiple times, you're going to lose them and they're going to get mad Mm -hmm. at you for saying, Mm -hmm. why are you here if you can't write? Mm -hmm. So the actual art, the brain work of being a lawyer, there's not a lot that you can do to prepare yourself. But you can prepare yourself and it's time for you to put that down in writing 
by being able by being a competent writer. You don't have to be the best, but just be competent. So what what would be uh, the one thing in your work that that attorneys typically have to do that either people may not know they have to do? It might be research. I might be answering my own question here or that attorneys do and they may not like doing and people don't know about that. Um, there are two things that attorneys don't like to do, um, but they do it anyway because the job requires it. And the first is research. You're right. Um, it's 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 a part. It's just it is what it is. Um, and the other part may seem sort of controversial depending on whom you ask. And I'm going to say it's billable hours. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you all who don't know what billable hours are, lawyers aren't like most professions where you start your work day at 9 a.m. You're done at 5.30. You put in eight hours worth of work because you have a half, a half hour lunch there. And then you just tell your boss, hey, I worked eight hours a day. I pay me. That's not how lawyers work. We have to assign our work. Well, that's not how the majority of lawyers work. For lawyers who do billable hours, you don't just walk in and start the clock. You walk in, you get ready, you get settled. So you may start your day at 9, but after you're ready to work work, it's 9.30. So that first half an hour, you're not paid. Once you start working, you have to account for all of your time to your client. So if you're researching a case for your client, you have to put down, I worked 1.2 hours for my client. And if you spent the rest of the day talking to friends, walking to the printer, waiting on a, a coffee or whatnot, all you can, all you've made that day is 1.2 hours. And it's that tedious keeping track of work. So the average lawyer will have 40 billable hours per week but we'll actually end up working 60 to 70 hours per week because you can't bill for everything that you're doing. And that it's that that that's annoying. That is that is a great example. And I certainly in in my experience have heard many attorneys comment on the frustration of billable hours. So thank you for bringing that up. Just a couple last questions here, but really important ones. So this one, uh, how does your job have a positive impact on the world? Um, our job has a, a being a lawyer has a positive impact on the world because once you once you graduate law school, and to a certain extent, even if you do decide to actually become a lawyer, because again, just because you graduate law school does not mean you are a lawyer. Hmm. You have a you have a very unique way of looking at the world, and if you decide to take the bar and you pass and you become a lawyer you still have that mentality that law school gave you. So you have the opportunity to settle disputes, to sort of calm the waters, and, and that is a positive. So the positive is not so much all lawyers reduce tax property, it's all lawyers have the ability to help out almost anywhere. Um, you, can, you can take your, once you become a lawyer, you can go ahead and join the Navy. And you can help them, so you can make a positive aspect even in the military life after becoming mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. after becoming a lawyer. You can be you can you can be helpful a lot of places. Yeah. So start. then, finishing up, what advice would you have for a, a sixth grader, a tenth grader, or maybe a recent high school graduate or a college student, uh, just in thinking about what they want to do with their life to help them kind of figure that out? Okay. Um, if you're in sixth grade or 10th grade and you're thinking about being a lawyer, I would say just make sure you understand how to write. Um, read a lot of books. Um, get that keen eye for uh, pattern recognition. Um, you know, if um, the classic SAT question, if this, then that, you need to sort of get that uh, mentality down. If you are in late high school or you're in college and you're thinking about being a lawyer, I would honestly say the best thing I can tell you is to go and meet with lawyers. Um, we are not reclusive. We are very open. If there is someone in your family or a friend's parent, whether it be their mom or their dad, is a lawyer, talk with them, shadow them for a day. Um, if you really, really, really want to be a lawyer after doing all that, I wish you the best of luck. But I will honestly say, just make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, SIU 
is one of the cheaper law schools in the state. And even then, I still gave up a lot of money to SIU. Um, I have friends, and I'm not going to say the name of the school, who went to law school, and after three years, they were in debt $200,000. That amount may seem very abstract to you right now. It's not very abstract when Sally May, Freddie May, Freddie Mac, uh, and the other student loan organizations start taking $1,200, um, $1,300 every month um, for your student loan payments. Um, so you have to look at that aspect and also ask yourself, is the lifestyle of a lawyer something that you truly want? Being a lawyer is not what it looks like on suits. You're not just walking from one pre room to the next pre room, you know, throwing a hand down. Harvey does something and you walk right back out. There's a lot of there's a lot of work that that takes place prior to that. And um, just just go with your eyes wide open. If, if there is anyone that you that, that is around you that has went to law school or that is a lawyer, you, 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 you need to talk to them and you need to sort of get their perspective. And if you can, do more than one person because the more you understand what you're getting yourself into, the more informed choice you can make. Because I I, I, I had a class that started out at 110 and by the end of the first year, it was down to 102. And that, mm -hmm. means, that means eight people left. Now they may have left for various reasons, but I know that at least two guys left because this wasn't for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking if you're going to law school to be a lawyer, one of the things that you should do is research. You should research the thing you're going to do before you do it. And so I don't want people to leave at the end of their third year going, oh, my God, what did I just do with myself? On top of the fact that you've lost time, but you've also lost some money. Well, that's exactly why we want all students in Illinois to be able to explore the career pathways while they're in high school and, and even in middle school and certainly be able to start narrowing down those things that they're interested in doing. And while careers may change and passions and interests and skills will will definitely change over the course of one's lifetime. Uh, we do want to empower students with that. So today, Arthur, you've been really helpful at giving students this window into the world of an attorney. We really, really appreciate that. For students who are watching, uh, remember if you or teachers, if you have ideas for occupations or people or questions that you'd like us to ask in our Career Pathways Virtual Trailhead series, please let us know on Twitter. Our Twitter account is at P20P20Network. At P20Network is how you can connect with us on Twitter. And we look forward to bringing you more episodes of Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads moving forward so we can take advantage of these opportunities to learn about work while we're learning at home. Arthur, thanks so much for joining us today. It was great having you. Thank you for having me.